It's Memorial Day weekend, and it's a great time for us to remember our servicemen and women who served in the armed forces. I have an uncle, Ruel, who passed away in World War II, and he's buried in Belgium. And um, he and his siblings, including my mom, they're all together in heaven now. But uh, it's a great time for us to remember and honor those who have served our country. I also want to remember in this particular teaching of one of my mentors, my pastor from Eugene, Oregon, his name was Roy Hicks Jr., was considered in our family of churches one of the greatest preachers and teachers in the country. And at a young age, uh, he was pastoring a church of over 5,000. It was during the same time of the Jesus People Movement, the, uh, the Jesus Revolution that uh, was just uh, in the movies that uh, remembered the life of Chuck Smith. Uh, about that same time, Roy Hicks Jr. was pastoring a church in Eugene, Oregon. He took over a group of about 50 people, and it grew to over 5,000. So that by the time I moved to Eugene, Oregon to go to Bible college, I got to go to his church. And um, I, I have great appreciation for my mom and dad. I, I loved listening to my dad preach every Sunday. I got to hear him for the first 17 years of my life. But then I got to move to Eugene, Oregon, and I got to listen to Roy for uh, close to 10 years, got to be on staff with him for over four years. And in remembering him today, he, he passed away at a relatively young age of 50 in a, a plane crash. But uh, Roy was beloved by so many. And uh, he, out of his church, he planted over 50 churches and had a great impact nationally and internationally. And in remembering him today, the reason I bring him up is because as we come to uh, this place in the Gospel of John, we've been studying the Gospel of John verse by verse, and I, I'll never forget, it was 48 years ago this last February. That's almost half a century ago. I'll never forget, I was 18 years old, freshman in Bible college, and I was at Eugene Faith Center on a Sunday morning. And the title of the sermon was, The Glory of God Causes Unity. And Roy said some things there that just... Um, really revolutionized my thinking about healthy relationships. And um, he refers to John 17. He starts in Nehemiah chapter 5. And I'm in honor of him today. I have heavily gleaned from a, that teaching that he gave that Sunday because I went away from that teaching knowing for sure that God had called me to be a pastor. I was so blessed by the word of God through what he said that Sunday that it stayed with me, and uh, if you've listened to me uh, any period of time at all, you, you might recognize some of these words, but um, I'm going to give this message, but I want to attribute, you know, they say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery, and uh, much of the content of what I'm going to share today is really from that sermon, uh, but let me begin this way. John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for oneness. It's the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he prays for the disciples, but he's praying for you and me. And here's what he says in John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Years ago, we as a church up here in Seattle got to demonstrate this unity in our West Seattle White Center Burien community when we initiated and partnered with five or six maybe eight other churches in our area from various denominations to host a children's vacation Bible school in a park in White Center during the summer. And we felt like it made a great statement to the community and to these churches about the importance of unity when on mission to reach our cities for Jesus Christ. In fact, I'd like to give a shout out to some of our leaders that spearheaded that and served faithfully for a number of years. Leaders like, and I, as I name a few of these leaders, I'm sure I'm missing quite a few, but uh, I have great appreciation for leaders like Tom and Angie Skoog, who headed this up, Nancy Smith, Bob and Tony Del Bianco, Maureen Del Bianco, Anita Mitsui, Bob and Catherine Orth, Bill and Vicki Knighton, 
great leaders who faithfully served and taught our children. It's a great witness of our faith in Jesus and demonstrates that Jesus came from God when we work together in unity. Again, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. It's so important to live and grow in community where we demonstrate unity around our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But when, when coming to Nehemiah 5, here's where I, I want to share some of the things that Roy had shared. And he, he began his sermon with Nehemiah 5. And here's what he said. He, he, he prefaced reading these words by reminding us that Nehemiah is a great study of the rebuilding of the walls of our personality. Nehemiah was there in Jerusalem, and after the exile, they had returned to Jerusalem. They were building the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, here's what um, Nehemiah, the first few verses, says. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, we are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards. Now let's break for a moment. Who were these bitterly resented Jews? They were either one, Jews who had become wealthy in exile and brought this wealth back to Jerusalem or descendants of Jews who had arrived almost a century earlier during the first return to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel in Ezra 1 and had established businesses. Many of the returned exiles were suffering at the hands of some of their rich countrymen. These people would lend large sums of money. Then when the debtors missed a payment, they would take over their fields. Left with no means of income, the debtors were forced to sell their children into slavery, a common practice of that time. Nehemiah was upset with these Jews who were taking advantage of their own people in order to enrich themselves. Usury is the practice of charging excessive, excessive interest. These practices violated, violated the law set forth in Exodus 22. So Nehemiah, needless to say, was a little upset. Look at verse 6. I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what, are you, what you're doing here is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also with my brethren and my servants am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus, may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. So there was a happy ending. But one of the principles that we learn out of this is that our own personal growth patterns will stop the moment community and relationship breaks down. We really do need one another. And here in Nehemiah, they were rebuilding the walls, but the work came to a grinding halt because there was a great outcry against the, their brethren. Now, it's important to remember this truth. I can get into heaven without you. I don't need you. You can get into heaven without me. You do not need me. But heaven's not going to get into us here and now without one another. We need one another to experience the fullness of God's life here and now. Forgiveness, redemption, entering into heaven by the grace of the Lord does not require a relationship with another living person on the face of this planet. All I need is Jesus. But when it comes to being a restored person, when it comes to being someone who is reaching his full potential in Jesus, I cannot make it without you. 
If community stops, restoration stops. If oneness stops, the growth stops. And if you're not involved in a growing relationship with people, you'll not be involved in a, in a growing relationship in, in and of yourself. If you're not enjoying relationships, life-giving and life-receiving relationships with people, your growth patterns will stop. We need one another. It is only as we are being built together that we become a habitation for God. That's the last verse in Ephesians chapter 2, and it's a biggie. We are being built together for a habitation of God. If you eliminate the together, you eliminate the habitation. What, what could be some of the parallels in our own experience? When we look at what was happening in Nehemiah, verse 3, where it says we've mortgaged our lands, vineyards, houses. Verse 4 says we've borrowed money for the king's tax, took loans against our land. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. Indeed, we're forcing our sons and our daughters into bondage to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. And then there was the exacting of interest. There wasn't enough. They were adding exorbitant interest into the, onto the loans. And verse 6 says, Nehemiah was a little upset. Nehemiah was ticked. When we need to, you know, we, we need to look at the exacting of interest and how that can happen in us in some ways today. Have you ever had somebody owe you something and you exacted interest from them? I'll admit I have. And I'm not talking about dollars and cents. When somebody says something against you or wronged you and they finally recognized their error and was willing to confess and kind of repent of it, but it wasn't enough that it could just be an exchange of forgiveness and confession of repentance. And then you setting the matter and making the account straight, but, but you demanded interest. It's like you required them to go just a little bit further. Have you ever done that? I know I have. It's not a blunt thing. It's a little bit of a subtle thing, you know, kind of like, well, I'm, I'm glad you called me and, and we'll, we'll just see. Let's just see how you do for the next couple of weeks. What's really happening is instead of just involving yourself as a member of the family of God and truly accepting someone ministering and manifesting the love of God, instead, you demand just a little bit more. And it creates kind of a slavery relationship where you put somebody in prison. You remember the story that Jesus told about the guy who had been forgiven a great deal by the master? It amounted to about $1.9 million in today's money. And he was completely forgiven. And then he turned to someone else who owed him a small amount of money. It was like $50. And instead of manifesting the same kind of forgiveness that he had received, instead he grabbed the man by the throat and said, you either pay me or you're going to jail. The guy said, I, I don't have it. I can't pay it. So he threw him into jail. You remember that story? He tells the story to demonstrate the principles of forgiveness that need to be demonstrated within the family of God. Within the family of God, there needs to be that kind of forgiveness. And he's saying to us that if you don't in turn forgive one another, even as you've been forgiven, you actually cause that person to be enslaved or to be in jail, in prison. I believe that there are some people out there who have not come to know Jesus because they've had family members who are believers, but those believers have not forgiven that person. And it causes them to be in a prison experience. That unforgiving attitude causes a prison experience and they are simply not able to respond because of an unforgiving attitude that someone had against them. Roy tells the story of uh, a friend, a pastor friend down south who was reading the word of God one day and in that section saw it, recognized his problem, a brother-in-law that he just couldn't stand. It's kind of like he pray, Lord, reclaim his life. But under the breath, he's going, he'll never make it, will he? He confessed that he really didn't like this guy at all. And the Lord showed him that because of the things that had happened in their younger married years, his unforgiving attitude had actually kept that man from being able to respond. And one day in a prayer time, he got down on his knees in his study, didn't write the guy, didn't call him up, didn't nail him face to face. Just before the Lord, he asked forgiveness and then he gave forgiveness. Just as he was praying, Lord Jesus, I don't want to have my brother in prison. I just, I forgive him today. And he said it out loud like he was addressing the world of the spiritual realm. I just want you to know that in my heart, there is nothing against this guy. He is totally forgiven from my side. And it was that week that the guy got saved. Now he said it, it just couldn't have been coincidence. The Lord dealing with him about it and then all of a sudden the man gets saved. 
Sometimes our unforgiving attitudes keep people in a position of slavery. At some point, my unforgiving attitude that puts them in slavery also causes a relationship for me so that I not only hurt them, I hurt myself. I put myself in prison. But what are some of the other expressions of slavery that could conceivably, conceivably happen in us? Sometimes I, I pin people up in my evaluation of their character. If I had evaluated a certain person in a certain negative frame of reference, a Christian who couldn't do this or always did this wrong, and if I had evaluated that so that I was expecting that from her or from him, everything she did around me, I would read into my evaluation. So even though she might not really be that way at first, because of my evaluation, that's what I would be receiving from her. The tragedy of that is that at some point, my relationship with her, because of this negative evaluation, because of this prison experience, because of this slavery experience I put her into, at some point, I'll actually trigger that kind of response from her. And though she may not have been that way at first, my evaluation of her will cause her to finally begin acting that way when she's around me. Husbands do that to their wives all the time. Wives do that to their husbands all the time. Parents can be guilty of doing that to their children. And some kids who end up in high school or college, they can end up doing that to their parents. Sometimes we enslave people by our evaluation of them. And I think the question needs to be asked, are you imprisoning people by your unforgiving attitude? What comes to me just in this moment is just, if I were to take these glasses off and put the glasses of heaven on, seeing people through the eyes of Jesus instead of seeing people through my flawed perceptions of them. Are you imprisoning people by your unforgiving attitude? Can you begin to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about how you might have allowed them that to seep into your life in such a way that it affects relationships around you? When that happens, it can cause relationships to break down and misunderstandings to happen. And we're really dealing with something in us. There's the call to forgiveness instead of the exacting of interest. Nehemiah gives a strong statement about freeing people and the people respond positively, sets the people free. It's a great opportunity for the Lord to speak to us and to help us to ask ourselves the difficult questions. What are some things happening that should not be happening? What are some things that are not happening that should be happening? Nehemiah is a type of the Holy Spirit. In fact, his name means someone to help, a helper. He's a type of the Holy Spirit. It's through the leadership of the Holy Spirit that the process of restoration takes place in our lives. Just as surely as Nehemiah had a place of leadership to direct the work and to see to it that it got accomplished, the Holy Spirit has that position of leadership in our lives, bringing about the Lordship of Jesus and causing the walls of our personality to be rebuilt. The Holy Spirit today wants to give us that kind of touch that only he can bring, that will bring us into oneness with each other. Let me read it again, John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, what Jesus just said there. He's talking about you and me. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The world will believe the identity of Jesus when they see the oneness in the family of God. Some of you got saved, came to Jesus because you were touched by the love of God's people for God and for one another. We could not deny the love. He's saying they'll believe my identity when they begin to see his oneness, this community experience. And then verse 22 tells you how oneness can come about. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. The glory of God causes oneness to take place. Now, you got to see this with me. A lot of people grew up in the church thinking that organized groups, Bible studies, would cause, cause oneness, but that will not cause oneness. Now, it may be an open door for oneness to be expressed, but it will not cause oneness. The only way the community can truly be affected, the only way that oneness can be caused is by you and, and by me personally being touched by the glory of God. That's exactly what Jesus said in verse 22. It is the glory of that he had with the Father, now given to the disciples, that brings about oneness. Well, what we need is a little glory. It's the glory of God that causes community to take place. Without the glory of God, there is no community. 
Community can only take place. Oneness can only happen together can only be an expression of life for us as we are touched by the glory of God. Without the glory of God, there is no community. The glory I had with you, Jesus says, I have given them so that they can be one. So we need the glory of God. I'm open for that. Are you open for that today? And I think some people would say, well, what is it? Well, in the Old Testament, the glory of God was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was the Shekinah glory that came upon the tabernacle, later upon the temple in the Holy of Holies. The glory was always a reference in the Old Testament to the very presence of God. It was a tangible expression indicating the presence of God was in that place. God wants to give you his glory, that tangible experience of his presence. And as you are being touched by the glory of God in such a way that you know the Shekinah presence of God is with you, then oneness begins to happen. It's a reference to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to bring to us the awareness of God's presence. And Jesus is saying to us that when we are being touched by the glory of God, we will be one with one another. So the glory of God is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. John 17, the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. And I would quickly add to that what we find in Galatians chapter 5. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that walk in the Spirit has always been, for so many people, interpreted as powerful, super-anointed ministry where we leap over tall buildings and catch bullets in our teeth and do other things like that. You know, the walk in the Spirit where you go around doing great big things. But if you read the context in Galatians 5, you'll discover that the walk in the Spirit does not have to do with ministry on the outside primarily, it has to do with togetherness on the inside. He's talking about how to get along with one another. Galatians 5 is a study of me getting along with you and you getting along with me. It's that chapter that lists the manifestations of the flesh and every single one of those has to do with a breakdown in people relationships. It's in that chapter that he mentions the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, and what, what are you going to have? Love for yourself? Love to yourself? No, no, it, it's love that you share. Joy to yourself? No, it's joy that you share. Peace left to yourself? No, it's peace that you communicate. The fruit of the Spirit is life that is given away, just as the gifts of the Spirit is life that is communicated or is given. Walking in the Spirit primarily has to do with how we get along with one another. If you walk in the Spirit, Paul is saying, you will never give in to the loss of the flesh. He's saying... If you walk in the Spirit, there will never be a breakdown between you and another believer. So today, you criticize me, and I hear about it. And the worst thing about it is that you're halfway right. Now, it's okay when they're totally wrong and you know they're wrong. You can always kind of walk away and say, well, I don't even have to listen to that. But when they're halfway right, that, that's the bad time. Now, if you did it in such a way that was really ungracious, then I would have the right to say, well, if you just carried yourself a little better as a believer, then maybe some life could have happened between us. But the moment I begin to put all the onus on you to be a believer, then I'm not going to be able to experience community. I'm not going to experience oneness. You see, it's not your responsibility to walk in the Spirit. It's mine. And no matter how wrong or right, but let's take it in the wrong for a second. No matter how wrong you might be in whatever you do, if I'm walking in the Spirit, there is not going to be a breakdown between us. Now, now can you tie into that? When you're walking in the Spirit, you will never be offended. Psalms 119, 165 says this, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you're walking in the Spirit, you will never be offended. When you're walking in the Spirit, there will not be a breakdown in relationship, no matter how wrong the person might be. So I discovered that so-and-so doesn't expect me. How, how can I be offended? I mean, if I'm being touched by the glory of God and I know that I'm accepted, how could it possibly offend me that I'm not accepted? In fact, if you'll just see it for a minute, when you're touched by the glory of God and you begin to understand in the fullness of the Spirit your relationship with Him, you begin to assume acceptance from everybody else. Instead of trying to achieve acceptance, you expect acceptance. When you're touched by the glory of God and you know you've been forgiven, instead of trying to manipulate forgiveness, you come to expect it. Now that's not taking it for granted. It's almost like you draw it from people. 
Walk in the spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. John 17, I have given them the glory, the experience of the presence of God in full measure, that they may be one. And if you're not one today with people, the answer is not for you to take a Dale Carnegie course or a self-improvement course. The answer for you is to be touched by the glory of God. Have you ever had the experience of asking for the glory of God? Have you ever said, Lord, touch me with your glory? Let me put it another way. Have you ever had the experience of opening yourself up for the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Jesus came to give us life and more abundantly. His whole purpose is coming in coming is that we could abundantly have his life. You can overflow with his life. And it's found in coming to Jesus and asking Jesus to fill us with his Holy Spirit. That's how we be, will be touched by his glory. Glory of God causes oneness, causes unity. And my hope for you is that you will experience the glory of God in your life every day. The power of the Holy Spirit that makes it possible for you to be one with the people around you. Let's pray and ask God to seal this to our hearts. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for speaking these words in prayer to our Heavenly Father that gives us the promise, the promise of unity and oneness. Come fill us with your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us that we may be one with one another and that we may show the world that you really came from God. Thank you, Jesus, for touching our hearts and for restoring our lives in such a way that we can have healthy relationships with one another. Thank you, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon us. Touch us with your glory that can cause the unity that will bring people to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your Memorial Day weekend. God bless you.